Chapter 30 I, part gnome? These are my reasons, Sam said. Your hair has ton highlights, which no other human hair has. It used to be all ton before you drank that dreadful potion. I must say, you were foolhardy when you did so. But, he held up a hand, you were foolhardy. He smiled at me. Yaj hem yod, rubak oizi. Foolishness may have golden offspring. I hope yours does. I did, too. There are more reasons than your hair to think you are part gnome. Before drinking the potion, you were wider than most humans. You were taller as well, which we cannot take credit for. However, we can take credit for your thinking it's cozy here. What's more, you discovered how to penetrate our rock curtain when you arrived. To be exact, no human has ever done so before. And I can allude, though I am no singer. But, but Sir Ulu said I wormed my way into people's affections as an ogre would. He said I looked like an ogre, too. Yes, I'm very put out with him. He hesitated. Maidazak, are you sorry to be part gnome? No. Although gnomes were ugly by human standards, their ugliness was far less repugnant than an ogre's. Not repugnant at all, really. It was the difference, perhaps, between the looks of a cockroach and the grasshopper. Besides, gnomes who'd stayed at the feather bed had always been kind. Mother and father had liked them, too. I'm not sorry, if I really am part gnome. You are. It has happened before. My aunt's husband had some human in him. Now was the time to ask. It is, um, may I stay here? Cousin, did you think we would toss you out? I wept again. For the second time in my life, I was being accepted into a fold. Zam cleared his throat. Perhaps you can teach us how to make our sumo as it should be made. I laughed through my tears. I'll be glad to. He cleared his throat again. To be exact, you can do more than that for us. I wiped my eyes. Yes? We would love to hear you sing. I have spoken of your voice ever since I first heard it. But also, I know of no human songs about us. So, would you compose a few? I wrote a letter to mother and father, telling all. Sam gave it to a messenger and also dispatched two gnome armorers to Antio Castle. While displaying their newest swords and shields, the armorers would see how news of my death had been received, and whether Ivy retained her former power. You may stay here as long as you like, Maidaza, Sam said, but it's best to know where matters stand. I wanted to ask the armorers to take note of Ajori, if he seemed to mourn me, or if he seemed untroubled, but then I remembered I didn't care. I wrote a series of songs about living with the gnomes. The song-making saved me from despondency and anguish. I couldn't think of Ivy or Ajori without rage or pain. Writing songs was better. My first song is about Sam and what he meant to me. I sang it at a dinner in the banquet hall. I was hardly nervous. Compared with my feelings the first time I sang at the castle, I was as calm as a tree. Sam had promised that everyone would love my singing, and I believed him. As I sang, I discovered how gnomes blush. The tip of Zom's bulbous nose turned violet. Which ye Zom, the green gentleman, to be exact, came many times to our ring. He said my hair was ton, and ton he said was beautiful. I was ugly, he said I was, I knew I was. He called all humans ugly, to be exact. I was uglier than the rest, but he thought not. The green gentleman thought not. If I leave here ever, if I come back never, I will know that there's time, and it is beautiful, beautiful to
to be exact. Lydia Yan, the green gentleman, to be exact, slide come. Danger on my shoulder, you didn't call me cousin then. Pebbles here are worth coaches home, footstools worth castles, castles to be exact. Today the green gentleman called me cousin. I can't say ton without his hand, but he called me cousin. Cousin, to be exact. If I leave here ever, if I come back never, I will know that there is Zam, and he is priceless, priceless, to be exact. My next song described the magnificence of gnome caverns. At the entrance to the banquet hall, for example, a milky rock tower rose, perhaps fifteen times my height. In clusters around the chamber were delicate rock straws that extended thinner than my pinky from floor to ceiling. The only aspect of the banquet hall I omitted from my song was the food. I yearned for more variety than what is dug up from the ground. After a week, I would have given my golden plate for a leg of chicken, a scone, a bowl of fruit. Some knew, I think, and others might have too. Often I'd pick at my food and remind myself I had to eat to stay alive. The greatest marvel in gnome caverns was the gnomes. They accepted my presence as though I had lived among them forever. They told me over and over again, in pantomime, since few spoke Eorthian. How glad they were to have a human visitor. They stayed in our world sometimes, but we never stayed in theirs. They liked my voice and my song, which Zan translated. They swayed just as we did when they liked something, and they liked everything. Two weeks after I came, a gnome asked me to sing for her daughter, who was to begin her apprenticeship as a jeweler. There was to be a ceremony. Both of them would be honored if I sang, and the mother would pay me. Would a small diamond be enough? A diamond? There were no coins here. The currency was gems. I'd never been paid for a song before. I would have refused the jewel, but Zan told me to accept. Then he educated me about no apprenticeships, so I could write the song. The ceremony took place in the market cavern. The maid chanted something to her new master and bowed from her waist. The maid's mother gave the master a scroll. I was told it was time to sing. Everyone smiled. This was my song. Today we celebrate. They began to sway. Today you end and you begin. The old is still sweeter than the new. You notice everything. Your shoe has a scuff. Your master hunches over. Your fingers don't do as they're told. But already you can pick a stone. You've loved the bead bowl since you were six. Remember? Remember, and don't forget the moments of your beginning. Name your tool, name your bench, name your lantern. Let us sing, let us sway, let us eat and drink. What a jeweler you'll be. We'll buy your wares, we'll be lucky to know you. We're lucky to know you now. At the end, they raised their hands as we do. Then the maid's father passed out tumblers of mineral water, the gnome's favorite drink, as our sumo was ours. We all drank, and the proceedings ended. The mother paid me. The diamond was smaller than the ones in the pebble bowl in my bed cavern, but it was mine. I'd never thought I'd own a diamond. As Zam and I left the market cavern, a candle vendor wanted to sell me candles. An old woman wanted to sell me tree root confections. Awful shriveled stuff. They knew I had a diamond to spend. When we reached Zam's parlor, I asked him to look into the future once more for me. I was wondering if I ever might go home. He straightened a book on his low table, then rang for a servant. It was time for his afternoon osimo. I had spent hours in the gnome's kitchen, going over the process of making osimo, and the gnomish chefs could now produce a drink of a brew. He picked up a book, then set it down. I have already looked ahead again for you, Maid Azak. When I put hold of you at the feather bed, I saw you here, but I didn't see beyond. Here you are, and we have gone beyond. 
he was frightening me. There may be a beyond that follows what I saw this time. What did you see? I saw you lying on the ground. Dead? Several figures milled about. Remorse and gloating came from one of them. Remorse and gloating both at once, to be exact. Was I dead? I don't know. You didn't stir.